Hello everyone. Now, I know that it would be easy for you guys to assume that because I get to drive both on and off camera a very large selection of very nice, fast and luxurious cars on a fairly frequent basis, that I don't really get too excited about cars anymore. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, there's a number of cars that I still absolutely lust after and consider dream drives. Now, fortunately, thanks to this channel and the people that I get to meet, I sometimes get to meet and drive some of my heroes. Today is one of those days because I'm going to be driving for the first time an Aston Martin DBS. Now, I don't know about you guys, but for me, from the moment I set eyes on this car, which was in the James Bond film Casino Royale, I've wanted one really, really badly. I mean, what's not to love? It's a gorgeous looking two-seater coupe with a manual gearbox and a thumping great big six-litre naturally aspirated V12 engine driving the rear wheels. It's perfection. Joy of modern Astons, the key or emotional control unit as Aston like to call it or a thousand pounds of misery as anyone that's ever lost one likes to call it. does sound like an Aston Martin should. It's an interesting view being in this car because I've driven a couple of the Vantages, as you may have seen on the channel, and it's fairly familiar. It's basically the second generation interior in here. And it's, well, it's a very nice place to be, but then it should be. It's an Aston. What I'm interested in is how it drives. Fly off handbrake, so you lift, press the button in, and hold the button as it goes down clutch biting point is quite high. Another classic Aston trait, bonnet that goes on forever that you cannot see. Oh, I'm just so wary of the size of the car. Now, this is not exactly a lightweight car, though it is actually a lot lighter than some of the newer Astons, which is always interesting when you see the amount of discussion they have regarding lightweight materials and carbon this and aluminium there. This car is basically 1,700 kilos. And I checked and the figures at Aston quote are actually, oh, hey, I stalled it. Oh, this car feels huge. These roads are, are not big, which definitely doesn't help. Another thing I have to keep my eye on is the fact that this car has an analog speedo that goes up to 220 miles an hour. Um, there is a digital speedo as well, which is very convenient because, well, I need it. The analog one is effectively decoration, really. It's very fancy looking but not especially easy to read at a glance. I'm also tragically going to have to put the windows up just for noise. It's a shame because that V12 does sound glorious. They'll be going down later. Now the gearbox itself is not bad to use. The gear lever is in a weird position. I feel like it's a bit further back than I would naturally want it to be. I think my hand would naturally want to go a little bit further forwards but there's no room for it to be anywhere else. And what you can feel is just the muscularity of that engine. It's over 400 pound foot of torque, 510 horsepower. And in terms of power to weight ratio, it's not a significant improvement over my Evora. I did the maths earlier, it's about 10% better on power to weight. But it feels like such a flexible power plant. You know, supercharged engines never really feel like their quoted power outputs, at least none of the ones I've driven do. Whereas these cars, I mean, this feels every one of those numbers. I haven't rung it out yet, of course, I've only driven it for about a mile. The red line's fairly low, it's just under 7,000 or about 7,000. Car generates maximum power at 6,500, so it's no screaming banshee Ferrari engine, that's for sure. Now the car's got carbon ceramic brakes, which were standard and were pretty new at the time. I mean, these were a very special car because they're a real blend of old and new. 
You see you have the carbon fiber, which also makes up some of the body work, as well as some of the interior in this particular car. And you have a lot of aluminum as well. You've got Aston's second generation V8 architecture, which is closely related to the architecture used to build My Lotus and also the Elise. Uh, but you've also got a manual gearbox. Now, this was an interesting move for Aston because at the time they'd been trying to do away with the manual. Famously, the original Vanquish used this hideous automated manual system that never really worked that well. And with DB9, they used a traditional automatic, which was a lot better. And then for this, and then for the V8 Vantage, they also used a manual. I'm so glad this is a manual. The auto option in the DBS was a traditional torque converter auto with paddles. The ride quality is actually not too bad. I must confess, I was expecting it to be pretty rock solid. And whilst it's certainly not a soft cosseting ride, not in the way that, say, a 4.3 Vantage is, it's not hideous. I've driven much, much worse. I recall at the time some people on Top Gear, James May in particular, really cursed Aston for making their cars far too stiff. And I remember the V8 Vantage S being quite stiff, and I'm pretty sure that's stiffer than this. This feels absolutely fine. Uh, the car does have adaptive suspension. You can put it in a sports mode, but in truth, on UK roads, most cars do best in their softest setting, and that's what I'm going to leave the car in. Even at these relatively low speeds, for a very large and not particularly light GT car, the steering is very nice. It's got a good weight to it, it's not unnecessarily heavy, nor is it unnecessarily light. And I'm getting a surprising amount of feedback and information and texture through the wheel. Texture is important to me because it allows you to really trust the information that's being fed to you through the wheel. Our V12 Astons do have some reputations. Now, one of them is for being hideously expensive to run in terms of fuel cost and servicing. Uh, this car hasn't really done many miles. It's only had the one service and so hasn't been too bad on that front. I'm certainly not in an ideal position to tell you about that. I can tell you that they do drink a lot of fuel. That's absolutely true. Another reputation they have is for being quite tail happy. Luckily, it's a glorious day today. And we have both the Royal Wedding and the FA Cup final on. So finding a fairly empty road in West Northwest London is actually quite miraculous. Even with the windows up, this car sounds glorious. And despite the fact that red line isn't very high, it really picks up near that top end. I'm quite impressed with it. It's just a really, really strong engine. I would have thought it would be really hard to stall a six litre V12. It's not. I nearly did it again there. It's the clutch pedal. It's really, really counterintuitive. I'd like to think that with the amount of driving experience that I've got, I can get in most cars and drive them to a reasonable degree of success. But for some reason, this car is just wanting to make me look like a bit of a tool today. Hey ho, I'll forgive it, she's beautiful. And she does move. It's certainly not sports car performance. And I don't mean that in terms of numbers, because it's quick. I mean, it's really quick. I mean, it's 510 horsepower, and there's no two ways about it. That's a lot. But the way it delivers its power is in that slightly more relaxed way that you want an Aston Martin to do it. Seeing the car up close and in the flesh, which is something I haven't done for a number of years, you do appreciate a number of other features as well. In particular, the bonnet. It's got a big raised hump in the middle of it, which reminds me of a lot of older muscle cars. And to be honest, I couldn't remember ever noticing that before. But when you're standing in front of it, it's actually very, very prominent and really helps set this car aside from its regular stable mates. Now, I don't think that the DB9, certainly the early version, has aged that well. I think it's really beginning to look like an older car. The V8 Vantage looks fantastic to my eyes, and this is pretty damn tidy too. It's certainly one of the most aggressive of all Astons that were ever made, and I think that's one reason that prices have held pretty steady. 
Now a nice low mileage example like this, which has only got about 13,000 on it, is worth in the region of about 125 grand. Now it may be a steep price of entry, but like a few other cars that I've reviewed recently, including actually the much cheaper V8 Vantage, because they're more or less holding firm in terms of price, I think you can offset a little bit of your annual expenditure by saying, look, it's not losing money. And certainly if you've managed to buy it cash, you can say as an asset, it's a fairly sensible thing to own because, well, you're not losing your cash and depreciation, so spending a grand or two every year on servicing it suddenly becomes an awful lot more palatable. I mean, let's be honest here, a BMW 320D has probably lost more money in about three years than some of these have lost in, well, nearly 10. It's odd how the car world works, isn't it, sometimes? A very expensive car, when you put it in those terms, can actually be quite cheap. I know it's tough to think of a £125,000 V12 6-litre Aston Martin as a bit of a bargain, but for probably several of this car's owners, it has been. I've driven very, very few cars with carbon ceramic brakes. I recall when this car came out, the idea of ceramics, certainly as a standard fit, was still pretty new. Other manufacturers have been doing them for a brief while, Porsche, Ferrari to name but two, and they'd done that to varying degrees of success. Now I recall Aston Martin always getting particular praise for their brakes, if nothing else, because they somehow managed to get carbon ceramics just right. Driving this car in these conditions and at low speeds, I can see where that praise comes from. Now the early carbon ceramics, some of the biggest problems they had were when you're driving them in normal conditions. These ceramics don't like working when they're not up to temperature. You take them on track and you thrash the hell out of them and they'll be absolutely fine. But it's when you're not using them to their full capacity that they can be at their weakest. That's simply the way that they're designed. They're derived effectively from race technology and race technology is built to make a car go fast when it's being thrashed at 100% all the time. These are nice and easy to use, very intuitive, much more so than the clutches, that's for sure. And you know what? There's obviously a valve in the exhaust somewhere because as I put my boot down, you can hear the note change quite dramatically. It takes on a real sharp, hard edge. It's just such a nice thing to listen to. And Aston Martin V12 is always glorious to listen to. I don't know what it is about Aston, but somehow they always manage to get the exhaust in their cars pretty much bang on. There's not many cars where I'd say I'd leave the stock exhaust exactly as it is, but with this V8 Vantage, yep, wouldn't change a thing. There she moves. For a big old boat, she moves. Handling's good as well. It's a transaxle gearbox, so the gearbox is actually at the back of the car for better weight distribution. About three and a half grand, that valve opens. That's an addictive noise. One that would certainly get me in trouble, I'm sure. So I've gotten used to driving so many turbocharged engines in modern cars that they're very easy to catch off guard. This one, though, there's always something there. Naturally aspirated engines, of course, have that glorious throttle response. This one's no different. What a motor. There's always something nice to be said as well about relatively large capacity naturally aspirated engines because you can just tell when everything's just so easy for them. That's one of the nice things about driving so even something like a Corvette. Oh, that bloody clutch. That's the easy, easy, least favorite part of the car is the clutch best part that engine is just awesome but the chassis and everything else don't feel like they're playing second fiddle at all it's still a really really good car but it's tough meeting a car like this that I've idolized for so long you know 10 years 
I've sort of just dreamt about one of these cars being like, oh God, how good would that be? You know, including like, when I first saw pictures of this car, I probably couldn't even drive. So, you know, how do you then put into words what the thing is actually really like? I mean, you have to be realistic as well. You know, this is, as a model, over 10 years old. I mean, realistic is probably about 12, 13 years old. But it's still nice. And the main thing as well to me, and what an Aston should always be about, is it looks awesome, it sounds awesome, and everything else is a bonus. So really, it does look awesome, it does sound awesome, it does actually move in a way that's somewhat alien to say uh, the V8 Vantage, the 4.3 V8 Vantage that I drove is not an especially quick car. This really is. I think it's perfectly comfy. I mean, perhaps, perhaps time has been kind to this. Maybe 10 years ago, this would have been considered a very, very stiff car. But now, actually, it isn't. I mean, yeah, you put the suspension in sports mode, it is a little harder edged, but otherwise, it's not that different. But the fact it drives nicely and is still a very nice place to be, as an Aston always should, just makes it all that better. Now I hope you guys have noticed that I don't put mid-roll ads on my videos. And that's because as a viewer to YouTube, they really, really wind me up. Nothing more distracting than being right in the middle of some lovely sexual car content when someone stops you for 30 seconds to try and sell you a kettle. So I thought I'd use the time to sell you something you might be interested in. And that's a website called www.carhuddle.com. A good friend of mine has just started it, and the idea is that it's going to be a simple directory of car meets. It's going to be based in the UK and possibly in time a bit beyond. So if you're trying to find a car meet or a show or you're hosting an event anytime in the near future, go on Car Huddle, check it out and, well, basically give us some feedback. Let us know if you like it. So I thought I'd mention it to you guys because, well, I'm sure you'd be interested in it. Now I don't give cars a score. If anything, I just give them a yay or a nay. And that's based exclusively, not on how good the car is, but what I think the car should be. And the DBS, considering it's an Aston Martin, gets a big fat yay from me. Is it a perfect car? Probably not, but I don't know too much about that because I haven't had to put fuel in it yet. But. I actually, honestly, I was expecting it to disappoint a little. I thought the ride, the handling might let it down. No, it's awesome. That engine is a masterpiece and everything else, oh, damn near as good as well. Thanks for watching everyone. Please like, comment, subscribe if you haven't already. We'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye.